Are euthanasia services coming to a church near you? Let's talk about it. Welcome to the Seven Ways from Sunday podcast. I am Larry Stump, your host and brother in Christ. The purpose of this podcast is to edify and equip the saints and to build up the body of Christ. You can find more biblical teaching and encouragement at sevenwaysfromsunday.com. I would like to play for you a short snippet from another podcast I listened to because I think that we are most likely going to be dealing with this particular issue in the church here in America somewhere down the road in the near future, sad to say. The issue? Euthanasia. That's right. Death with dignity, as some call it. We would do well thinking this through now so that we can make sure that we have our theology on this very emotional issue in line with our Bibles. I want to play for you a segment here from a podcast that I had listened to that will open up this discussion for us. I to a story that caught my eye, and it's truly disturbing on a number of levels and, and also fascinating that this would happen inside of a church, but the story was titled Canadian Church Host controversial assisted suicide ceremony for member with ALS. Now, this is Churchill Park United Church in Winnipeg. They recently hosted what is being known as a crossing over ceremony. Can you explain what this is? Yes. Well, um, last, last month in March, uh, the church held a ceremony for an 86-year-old woman named uh, Betty Sanguin. Um, she suffered from Lou Gehrig's disease, and she was planning to undergo a medically assisted suicide, uh, which is legal under certain circumstances in Canada. And uh, she requested that the procedure, which they sometimes refer to as medical assistance in dying or medical aid in dying, made for short. Uh, she specifically requested that it be held uh, in, a, in the church that she had belonged to for several years and had been volunteered at for several years, and the, and the church uh, agreed to do it. You know, it, it's it's interesting. It's interesting to me that a church would do this because let, let's talk about the specifics of this again. This is something that was held in a church sanctuary. What what was the church's rationale for why they felt it was important to not only hold the event but to do it in the church sanctuary? Uh, well, the church leadership, um, I, I got to interview the Reverend Don Rolk, who was the uh, minister at Churchill Park, and uh, according to her, the leadership they unanimously approved it because the, the reasoning they had was that they felt that since sanctuaries are where we see things like baptisms, marriages, funeral services, in their opinion, this was just one more example of one of these uh, uh, ironically titled life rituals, as she called them. Um, as he reasoned, and uh, quoting uh, Reverend Rolk, uh, quote, For us, it was perfectly natural to hold this service for Betty in our sanctuary because death is a natural part of life, and Betty had lived a good part of her adulthood in this faith community. So that was basically their reasoning. So take us through the events that unfolded before Betty passed away, because it was it was interesting to see how this was described, and when I'm speaking of the events, I mean the very specific things that happened that day during this crossing over ceremony. Yes, um, well, what happened during the day, first in the morning what they did was they actually rearranged the sanctuary. They, they temporarily moved uh, the pews and put um, you know, comfortable chairs, tables, uh, some flowers. Uh, there was a recliner that um, Sanguin uh, sat in during the entire event, uh, because at this point she had already lost like her ability to walk very well or stand for very long. So basically she was in that recliner the whole time. Uh, you had people, you know, family members and close friends who, who came and went throughout the morning of the day. Um, at one point, um, Rolke actually gave a blessing, uh, like a prayer over the event as well. Um, it was around um, like 1 p.m. of the day that the, that the medical professionals showed up to administer the chemical injection that, you know, performs the assisted suicide, and the uh, the injection eventually took her life around 2 p.m. 
Uh, and uh, Rolk uh, herself compared this part of the event to being like a wake. Um, there's a lot of comparisons to a funeral wake, where basically from like 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., people just basically paid their respects to the family members who were there, because by this point, of course, um, Sanguine had passed away. And then around 4 p.m., uh, a local funeral home you know, picked up the body and made the usual preparations that one makes for a recently deceased person. Western civilization, civilization I'm sorry, and in our immediate case, we'd have to say America has devolved into a culture of death. Abortion on demand, practiced for decades, and now some are seriously proposing infanticide. That's right, you heard me, infanticide. The right of the killing of infants. You see, it's not enough anymore to take life in the womb. We now want to take it out of the womb as well. And now we're seeing euthanasia being promoted as an acceptable way of solving some of the various social and financial problems that people are facing. Listen to this quote from another article I've read explaining the problem that we face. This focus on death as an answer to the world's problems is a total reversal of the biblical model. Death is an enemy, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. Life, life is a sacred gift from God, Genesis 2, 7. When given the choice between life and death, God told Israel to choose life. In Deuteronomy 30.19, euthanasia spurns the gift and embraces the curse. That is, is the most succinct definition of the problem that we face. Now this issue came on the scene very, very vividly for me as, as T90. Do you remember the name Jack Kevorkian? Jack Kevorkian had been instrumental in helping people commit suicide. He wrote a book called Prescription Medicine the goodness of planned death. And in that book, he promoted his view of euthanasia and describes his patented suicide machine, which he called the Mercy Trauma. Get it? Mercy, the Mercy Trauma. He first gained national attention by enabling Janet Atkins of Portland, Oregon, you may remember this, uh, to kill herself in 1990. They met for dinner and then drove to a Volkswagen van where the machine waited. Jack then placed an intravenous tube in her arm and dripped a saline solution until she pushed the button, which delivered first a drug causing unconsciousness and then a lethal drug that killed her. An act of mercy. Now, I can hear already some object objections to this, and I get it. It's a tough issue. And I can see that we're going to probably be doing a second podcast on this to continue this topic, even... <laughs> even in, in the brief span of time that we have to cover it. But you might be thinking something like this about now. Well, how come we call it a, a mercy when we take a life or euthanize our pets or, or some other animal that's in extreme pain and would have no chance for healing or survival? How come it's okay to end that life but not a human life? And I get it. I get it. I struggle with that too over the years. Because it is kind of ironic, isn't it? It is kind of ironic that we would put an animal in a hopeless condition, out of its misery, motivated by our compassion, yet not to be free to do the same with a human being, with, with a spouse, with a child. But the issue is here that man is made in the image of God. An animal is not. And though God has granted such rights over animals as, as he has given us uh, the right to rule and reign over them, he's not done so in the case of human beings. You see, animals aren't on the same level as humans. I want to read to you a quote from Charles Colson. He explains it much better than I could. And here's the quote. He says, humans are unique in all of creation. We are conscious of our existence, aware of death, capable of works of great creativity, and the only part of creation that bears the image of God. Humans alone have eternal souls, which confers unique moral status. That's why putting down an injured horse is worlds away from killing a suffering person. End quote. Now, I think it would be helpful in our discussion to distinguish between mercy killing and what could be called mercy dying. Taking a human life is not the same 
It's just not the same as allowing a nature to take its course by allowing a terminal patient to die. The former, we could say, would be immoral and perhaps even criminal, while the latter one is not. However, as one commentator points out, drawing the sharp line between these two categories is not as easy as it used to be. Modern medical technology has significantly blurred the line between hastening death and that of allowing nature to take its course. Now, there are two main reasons for this. Two main categories, I should say, of euthanasia. Now, this topic, granted, it's more complex than what I'm able to do with here, but I've knocked it down for the point of our discussion to these two things. Just that of involuntary euthanasia and voluntary euthanasia. Involuntary, involuntary euthanasia requires a second party who would make decisions about whether active measures should be taken to end someone else's life or not. Voluntary euthanasia is where the sick party, that person, makes the choice, makes that decision for themselves. But in either category, what we need to recognize is there is an erosion of the doctrine of the sanctity of life. And that's foundational to our discussion. Is life sacred? Is life a gift of God? Are we created in its image and likeness, image bearers of God? Are we different than the animals and what evolutionary theory would teach us, which which builds into, I would suppose, into this idea of euthanasia being morally acceptable in our culture today. Now, I do want to get into this topic a little bit deeper, but I'm going to save this a little bit deeper for the next time as we look into what the Bible teaches regarding life and death issues, and then we try to bring this thing to a close. I know the issue is complex, and I know it's emotional. I know nobody wants to sit by the bedside or be in the house with someone who's going to suffer for very long periods of time in extreme pain without no recourse. How can we, you know, we struggle with that in our thinking of how we can justify allowing that to happen. But we do have to understand in this discussion and in our response to it, if we have to face it in our own life or if it starts filtering into the church in America. Right now it's in Canada, and Canada is not too far away from us. Once you start to legalize something, it isn't that long. I mean, think about it. Till it infiltrates the church. Till it infiltrates culture. How long does something that begun in California stay in California? How long has a lot of the false philosophies and worldviews that we have, we have heard about from the 1600s and so forth overseas somewhere, in, in Geneva and elsewhere, in England and, and so forth? How long has it taken? All right? Not all that long. And eventually what happens is that they come to America And they cross the globe and they cross our state from one state to another. They cross our land and it becomes a problem. And this is no different with culture and society within a church. So that is what we need to be aware of. And I think we need to seriously contemplate this issue. So we have our theology right so that we understand what God says about this issue. And we are ready in obedient faith to act accordingly. So with that in mind... I leave you with this. Until next time, let us walk by faith and not by sight.